Hello there, YouTube. Uh, it's been two weeks since I've been able to put out a uh, an update as um, I had family visiting, so I wasn't really able to put one up last week. But it's been an interesting couple of weeks. It's been quite uh, quite light, uh, nothing too uh, nothing too shattering for my uh, my normal day to day activities. I've read a little bit, I've watched a little bit, I've played a little bit. So, this is my weekly update for the last two weeks. Um, so, what have I been reading, first of all? Well, I have been reading The Blade Itself. And, um, First Law, uh, if, you, uh, if you're unfamiliar with, uh, with the channel, you might not know, but there is a series review for The First Law on my channel where I give a, uh, a standard cookie cutter, um, you know, book tube uh, expected response to what the first law is, and it, it actually made people think I'd already read this, um, because apparently it was that believable. Um, I hit all the same notes that all the, uh, all the YouTubers generally do. Um, but having, uh, having actually read a fair bit of this now, uh, I'm still, yeah, I'm still only, uh, only a little way in. Um, I can say that Glocker does steal the scenes that he's in. He is the most memorable character we've met so far, and um, I am shocked at just how dark this feels. As um, as books go, it is grim in a way that I haven't seen before. Now, I've read the first three uh, A Song of Ice and Fire books, and they are grim. They are regularly and constantly grim, but there, there are moments of levity and moments of, um, of character hope that I feel makes it so that whilst it is a grim story and there is a lot of, uh, a lot of conflict, there is also a lot of hope, determination, and... Um, familial bond this doesn't have that at least so far it doesn't um, the blade itself so far has been consistently grim the entire way through and genuinely depressing it's very well written it's really enjoyable um, but following both Glocker and Logan it is Impressive how much they make the uh, the, the story feel hopeless. Um, both of them feel like they're right on the edge of, of just wanting to pack it all in. Like the the level of of depression shown amongst these characters at the beginning of the book, at least, is so intense that I would actively advise anyone with suicidal tendencies to not read this book. Um, it is it is that level of constantly dour um, and I wasn't expecting that I was expecting grim um, and I was expecting character driven but I'd heard that it was it was grim with moments of levity I'm not seeing those moments of levity at all um, I'm seeing constant cruelty and a sense that the entirety of this world is culturally cruel to a fault so I don't know what to make of it uh, I'm enjoying the writing style, and the characters is very interesting, but I'm not sure if this is going to be a little too grim for my taste, which I wasn't expecting. We'll see, we'll see. Um, now, what else have I been experiencing? Well, I watched a little bit of TV. I've watched, um, I watched a few more episodes of um, Farscape, and uh, I've been enjoying them. And... Uh, we we have now reached a point where I now know who the blonde herd girl is that I've seen in all the uh, in all the the promotional stuff, all the posters, um, and she is a fascinating character. I really like uh, seeing how she interacts. Farscape is still one of those shows where I'm not sure what I make of it yet, um, because there's no hierarchy, there's no captain or anything like that. It doesn't have a Star Trek vibe. There's no one that makes the decisions. There's a constant feel of um, of tension amongst all the people aboard, because they all have different goals. 
and they're all there always seems to be um, a fight between them as to what they're going to be doing and that is uh, that is interesting to watch though it can get a bit tedious after a while though I wonder if maybe it's because I tend to watch multiple episodes in a row um, as a sci-fi show it is very soft in its sci-fi and has a lot of like, outright magic in it like, there are fantasy elements that are uh, that are explicitly fantasy. Um, we have multiple uh, accounts of like full-blown psychics and things like that. So that's that's a a pain for someone who wants a sci-fi experience. But I would still say it, it makes a good space opera, which marries both elements of sci-fi and fantasy together. Um, other than that, uh, I've watched a couple of films. I managed to get to the cinema with my brother while he was visiting, and we watched Free Guy, um, which is a, a really good comedy. Um, it's a, it's a, a nice uh, gamer, geek culture-inspired comedy about the nature of what an NPC is. And it, it asks the very profound question... At what point does killing an NPC become a moral issue? Like, if you're running through the games, you're slashing your way through all the NPCs, you cut them down, you shoot them in the face, whatever it is, they're just data on a computer, it doesn't matter. But at what point do they become sentient? At what point do they become people? And it's, it's one of those questions that we are going to have to answer at some point. Because as we make games more and more intense, more and more... Uh, realistic. As we program more and more artificial intelligence into NPCs in games, eventually we're going to reach the point where the NPCs are no longer just um, scripts going in a circle, doing the same things, waiting to be shot in the face by the, uh, by the player. Uh, they're going to have uh, emotions and they're going to have reactions. And yes, it's a simulated cry of anguish and a simulated bout of grief, but how much do you have to put into a program? How much do you simulate pain before it's real pain? And I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I want these questions asked or answered, because it calls into question the morality of the entire hobby. Um, like, at what point do you stop and start? Like, it's the same argument a lot of people had uh, in like the eighteenth, the eighteenth and nineteenth century about animals. Uh, animals were considered automata, uh, which is the correct way to pronounce that word. For all those people who have played near automata and don't realise that it's automata, not automata. While we're at it as well, I'm just going to take a small, uh, small um, detour to talk about uh, Bloodborne for just a moment. Um, why is it that Bloodborne players and Bloodborne content creators on YouTube cannot speak? That they don't know words. Um, I was willing to forgive the fact that no one knows that the word amygdala is amygdala, not amygdala. The boss is called amygdala. It's named after a part of the brain. It's called the amygdala, not the amygdala. It would not have taken much for you to look that fucking word up. Now, that's one. But how on earth... How on earth has the entire Bloodborne community managed to fuck up the word vicar? You know, vicar as in priest and vicar, like a member of the church. Because there is a character called Vicar Amelia. And the amount of people who think that it's Vicar Amelia is bizarre. Right? How can you... It's, it's not exactly a, com a complicated word. It's as if they think that's the character's first name. Right? I've even heard people refer to the character as just Vicar. As if it's a name. No, it's Vicar. As in the Vicar. Now, admittedly, the character is like a 15-foot-tall dog-faced creature, so, you know, maybe they didn't realise that the character is clearly a vicar. And maybe it's because it's a female name, and female vicars don't exist in every sect of Christianity, but even still, it says vicar. 
But amygdala was an understandable one. Like, not many people know the names of parts of the brain. Like, I, I wouldn't expect people to necessarily be familiar with the, with the term cerebellum. But... How many people can reach adulthood and not be familiar with the word vicar? So yeah, um, that aside, I lost track of what I was talking about, like just words being mispronounced and uh, pronounced in strange ways. Um, I was talking about um, like characters being killed off in games. So yeah, um, so how how far do we have to go before? There is a moral argument about it. Ah, that, that's it, yeah. Um, animals. Animals were considered automata uh, back in the, uh, the 18th and 19th century. Uh, people didn't believe that animals felt real pain or had real emotions or any real sense of sentience. They were basically robots in the eyes of most people. Um, which meant that cruelty to animals wasn't a crime. Um, you could... You could um, be cruel to an animal and well, it's just reacting. It's no different than a chemical reaction. It's only a modern sensibility that now being cruel to an animal is looked down upon by almost everyone. Even down to the point where if if you had a, a slug and you slowly poured salt on it, people would be angry at you for torturing a slug, which is definitely not sentient. Um, the, the complexity of any nerves or, uh, or, or brain tissue in a slug is extremely small. Um, people would, would still get very, very upset though. People get upset about mouse traps that don't kill quickly. Um, and uh, the idea of a mouse being trapped in a mouse trap and suffering. Um, puts people in a lot of distress, myself included, as I had to set mouse traps in my own home and caught one and it didn't die. And I realised just how upsetting it was when I had to then kill the injured mouse. And my god, that was uncomfortable. That was, that was gut-wrenchingly uncomfortable in a way I wasn't expecting. Because they're vermin. They're vermin and they're dangerous and they, are, they would make me very ill. They're going to crawl around my house, shit all over my food cupboard and all over my plates and things like that, and they're going to make me sick. And with my immune system, that could be very dangerous. I need to get rid of them. And I, it's not as if I can put it outside. I don't have a garden, and if I leave it in the street, it's just going to come straight back in, obviously. Because I'm the source of food. So, it's not like I could get rid of it in any other way. So, I set a mouse trap. Now... The sentience of a mouse, or the sentience of a slug, is tiny. It's barely recognisable. So, how far do you have to be before a simulated human that simulates pain, familial connections, anger, grief, um, fear? If you program a pro, if you program an artificial. Um, person with those kinds of reactions, are they a person? It's really hard to know where the, the limit lies, really. It's, it's a question that I think is going to become one of the biggest questions of the, tw of the, the 22nd century, at the very least. P possibly one that will be, that will be touched upon in the 21st century. Um, it is going to be one of those things where artificial um, artificial rights and artificial life are going to be considered to be a big question. And it's, it's going to reach this point where we're going to need to question, are fictional characters worthy of rights? And this is where it goes to an absurd level, because it's still a question of morality. If you write a fictional story, if you write a novel in which a character is fully realised, has a personality and a, a sense of pain, and then you write events in that book that causes them to feel pain and anguish and grief or even death, are you torturing that character? And if you are, 
like let's face it, like in in um, in the uh, the blade itself, Glocker is torturing people. Now, it's Glocker doing the torturing. So is it Glocker that's the torturer, or is it Joe Abercrombie? Is he torturing someone on the page? Is there a moral issue there? Because that person feels pain, they feel fear. He wrote them to feel the pain and fear. They only exist on the page, they only exist as a concept. But at what point does an artificial intelligence cease being a concept and become a real thing? I think this is one of the biggest questions that humanity is ever going ha to have. At what point does a fictional creature go from being fictional to being factual, to being a thing, a real tangible thing? Um, if a character written in a book isn't real. And I think we'd all agree that they're not. If a character written in a book isn't real, then torturing them and killing them doesn't matter. But at the same point, if that fictional character is then put in a video game where you, in, you interact with it and you move another character and you can walk up and stab them, they're still not real, they're fictional, they're just written down in code instead of in, in writing. Um, so, is that moral? Is it moral to jump on the Goomba? Is it is it moral to uh, to to stab the uh, the enemy in in Assassin's Creed? How much AI do we have to program into it before it becomes immoral? Before it becomes a tangible person? And how how different is code to written text? How much backstory do we have to write in a book before the person becomes real? Does does the person have to exist in a state? where they can continue to exist and their time frame isn't frozen when the writer isn't writing. Because that's the difference between books and video games. If we're writing a character in a book, if we stop writing them, their time freezes. Nothing else can happen to them. The, the, the time that happens in that book does not, does not continue until you continue to write the story. Until you write the next, the next sentence, the, their universe is in a state of pause. But not so in a video game. In a video game, when the, the programmer has programmed the enemy, um, that enemy exists without the programmer having to constantly program. So, when the player is playing the game, that, that's, that artificial person can exist independently of anyone interacting with them. So at that point, uh, is that the, uh, the difference? Is that what makes an artificial um, person... Uh, a tangible person because they can exist without someone else's input it's hard to say it's really hard to say because I would say if I met an independent artificial intelligence that thought for itself genuinely thought for itself I would consider it a person and I would consider anyone attacking it or hurting it to be, be being cruel being an evil person but what if it only has rudimentary concepts of pain? I would be just as angry if someone hurt my cat. Like if, I, if I have a pet cat and someone was to, to hurt that cat, that would, that would bother me very, very um, uh, profoundly. Like I, would, I would hate them for being cruel to my cat. So what if we had a, an AI that was only as sophisticated in emotions and thoughts and sentience and self-awareness as a cat. Which isn't really that far off from what we already have. At that point is killing them, is hurting them a moral issue. This is something that I will I will ponder about forever. I genuinely do not know the answer, and I'm afraid of the answer, because I'm afraid the answer would mean that I can't engage with fiction anymore. <laughs> because I'm, I'm genuinely afraid that the answer would be that it is, it is immoral to play video games. Like, I'm, I'm afraid I might come down on that side, and I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Um, I, I'm, but I'm also of the, of the opinion that it could, if I come down on that side... Um, the absurd conclusion of that line of thinking is it's also immoral to, to engage with fiction at all. To come up with a fictional story in which anyone is hurt in any way is a crime against the fictional person. But now I'm, now, now I'm, 
effectively considering thought crimes to be a real thing, and that's something I could never get behind. So, I I am confused as to exactly where I stand on this, but it is one hell of an interesting topic to delve into, and it's amazing that a comedy uh, where Ryan Reynolds uh, plays an NPC and silly things happen um, can spark such a philosophical thought. Um, and I, I encourage other people to, to chew over this idea because I think it's fascinating. Um, yeah, outside of films and books, um, I haven't been playing a great deal of video games because I've had family visiting. Uh, I did get a chance to play a little bit of Axiom Verge 2, which came out very recently, and I didn't even notice it was out. It had been out for a week before I realised it had been released, because it released with absolutely no fanfare. Uh, there, was no, uh, uh, there was no announcement that it was coming. Um, so I just happened to spot it on PlayStation Plus, uh, on PlayStation Network, sorry, and downloaded it. it. wasn't on PlayStation Plus, it's not a free game or anything. Yeah, you start to buy it. But, um, yeah, I've been playing that for a, a little while, and um, it's pretty good. Uh, I've not got very far in, so I don't know how I feel about it. So far, I'm preferring the original over the sequel, but I haven't got far enough into the sequel to really give it a, a true um, a, a true review or... Uh, get a real sense for what it's like. It does appear to be a fair bit harder than the original. So that's interesting. Um, I haven't had a chance to play much of anything else. Um, I am, however, looking forward to playing a few other games. And a few games have been um, on my mind recently uh, because I have been doing a lot with Dungeons & Dragons. And a few videos will be coming up soon, because one of the things that I want to do is uh, I want to post some videos about uh, modifications to D&D and uh, influences that other media can have on D&D. For example, I find the weapon system terrible in D&D, and this is going to be possibly my next video, is um, Dungeons & Dragons weapons are just wrong, so I have rewritten them, and I'm going to go over exactly why they're wrong and what I've rewritten. But then I also want to add in other... Uh, weapons that are more fantastical and make them into magical weapons and fantasy weapons in D&D. Explain how I would incorporate them. And that includes weapons from Bloodborne, because I think Bloodborne has a lot of really, really good material that you can uh, you can use in a uh, in a D&D campaign. Uh, I highly recommend pilfering as much from Bloodborne as you can. There's a lot there. Um, Monster Hunter, I think, is... Uh, an area that you can you can use. You could easily use the monsters from Monster Hunter as monsters in a D&D campaign. There's plenty that you could take from that. Um, but I also think you can modify some of the weapons. I think there's still a little bit of gold there. Some of them are ridiculous, but there is a little bit that you can play on. Um, and also, Devil May Cry. I, th I think the weapons in Devil May Cry can also be uh, modified and included in D&D very, very nicely. Uh, it works very well, and I also think that if you've ever played DMC Devil May Cry, that Limbo universe, that I think is a fantastic idea for a dungeon. <coughs> and something that uh, I fully intend to use in a future campaign of mine. Uh, the idea of there being maybe like a magical necklace or something, but when you touch it, the entire party is taken to this pocket dimension in this strange um, dungeon where there are floating platforms and variable gravity and almost like an Escher painting. There's so much you can do with that. So I think there's a lot of elements you can take from uh, video games and popular culture that you can put into D&D and I fully intend to make videos about all of those topics. I also want to make videos about how I would build certain pop culture characters such as uh, Darth Vader, um, Iron Man, um, those kinds of characters as D&D characters, and yes, you can do Iron Man as a D&D character. Um, it's actually shockingly easy to do Iron Man in a medieval D&D campaign. And when I say medieval, like, it's not really, like, there's magic and there's Artificer Tech, which is basically a mix of steampunk and Magitech. Um, but between them and a suit of enchanted full plate, you can basically play Iron Man. And uh, yeah, I've, I've got ways in which I can do that. I'll, I'll show that off later. Um, and none of my character builds are going to be level 20 builds either because I hate that. Um, all of my character builds are intended to be level 8 builds because I want them to be 
a build where they're, they're powerful enough that they are um, usable and uh, they, they can actually be played in a campaign, but not so low level that they're barely recognisable. Like, eight levels is plenty that I've, I've got enough to play with there. I've got at least two feats, three if I, if I pick very inhuman, and I can, uh, I can play around and, and tweak them accordingly. And Discord has now, has now woken up and started beeping at me. It was too much to ask for it to stay quiet for half an hour, wasn't it? Anyway, uh, that has been my week, so uh, hopefully that was entertaining. Um, hopefully that was in interesting to know what I've been up to for the last two weeks. Uh, I will be back next week with another weekly update. Until then, um, yeah, uh, I'm hopefully going to finish uh, the blade itself uh, in the next few days because I'm, I'm quite getting into it, but it is... It is quite an in-depth um, and quite a, a grim read, so it's one of those where I can only read a few pages before I, I need to do something else, because it's just too much. Um, so I may alternate between that and uh, The Arm of the Sphinx, which I have started reading, only a few chapters in, and I put it down because that family were visiting and I was distracted, so I didn't get to read much at all last week, um, or, or over the last two weeks, like it was over last weekend and a little bit either side. Um, but yeah. Anyway, I am going to, uh, I'm going to go and hopefully I can upload this before the end of the day. It's, uh, it's almost half nine and um, my computer has a tendency to take forever with these videos. So even this video, which is, what, a little over half an hour maybe, uh, it's going to take about two hours to render and upload. So getting it up before 12 will actually be a challenge. But I'll give it a try and see what I can do. Uh, until next time, I'll see you later. And uh, thanks for watching. Bye.